You're listening to the RN Mentor, a podcast designed to document and bring you the work and experience of some of the most influential nurses in our profession. We will be sitting down and having a discussion with the leaders of today's nursing world as they share their work, how they navigate their nursing path, and their views on the future of the profession. My name is Ali Tayeb. I am a registered nurse. United States Navy veteran, a Jonas Veterans Healthcare Scholar, and your host for the RN Mentor. Hello and welcome to another episode of the RN Mentor podcast. Very excited today to be joined by Dr. Piri Ackerman Barger. Uh, she is the Associate Dean of Health Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, as well as a clinical professor at the University of California, Davis, Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. She also directs faculty development for education and co-directs the Interprofessional Teaching Scholars Program for UC Davis Health. Over her career, Dr. Ackerman Barger has combined her expertise in nursing and education to advance a program of instruction on workforce diversity, health and education equity, and institutional sustainability. Her research identifies strategies to cultivate the skills and knowledge that healthcare providers, educators, and leaders need to diversify the healthcare pipeline and graduate equity-minded healthcare professionals. That is a lot on your plate. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so we'll start with my regular question is how did you get started in the world of nursing? Yeah, um, it, it's an interesting story. I mean, it, it feels like the conversion of, of several different factors. Um, I think that at the core of my interest in nursing was the ability to combine both the social sciences and um, the biological sciences, the health sciences. And I had an inclination when I was a teenager, like I was usually the, the helper. And I remember once um, a friend of mine um, hit his head pretty badly and had blood in his ears. Uh-huh. And I was really worried about that. Um, I knew that that couldn't be right. So um, I went with him to the emergency room and I was a person that woke him up every hour <laughs> in the night. And, you know, he ended up being fine, but it just felt like a personality fit for me. Um, so nursing was this, this nice combination of the things that I just really loved to do. And the other thing, you know, keeping it 100% real, one of the things that was important to me as somebody that grew up um, very, very poor was that I wanted to have a steady income, something that I could rely on. So that did factor in. And, you know, I don't want it to make it sound like I went into nursing for the money. But, you know, if we're going to keep it 100% real, nursing has the ability to, to change people's socioeconomic status. And that's something that happened for me. And I am forever I'm forever grateful for nursing yeah. for that reason. Uh, I, one of the things that um, that you mentioned uh, actually rings very true, and it's one of the one of the main reasons. Over time, I've kind of looked changed my perception of ADN programs because it really is a way for individuals to not only get into the profession, uh, but also from a socioeconomic level. Just really, it's a nice step up. Uh, yeah. for individuals to get out of poverty and uh you know uh, for years um i i know um i always heard bsn entry bsn entry bsn entry uh, right. and i and i drank the kool-aid on that for years until i really started looking at them like what's the impact of removing adn programs and i think that's uh but we, we, we digress but but very true though yeah. very true it, a lot of yeah. people this is a way including myself of, of making sure that we have, not only we enjoy the work, but we also make a decent living yes. um, as a result of it. So thank you. Um, uh, so what made you decide where you were going to go to school and mm. which area you're gonna be working at? Oh, okay. Um, so I am from Humboldt County, 
in California, which is the very, it's the northernmost coastal county in California. So it was very rural. Um, and there, there weren't a ton of choices, but even so, I, I decided that I wanted to go to school near home. So I went to what was then called Humboldt State University and is now Cal Poly Humboldt um, and had a really amazing nursing experience there. Um, I originally wanted to be a labor and delivery nurse. I had the opportunity when I was about age 19 to work with a midwife and um, it, it was really incredible experience to get to work with her. Um, so I went to nursing school thinking I was going to go into L&D and I just got um, distracted by some of the really high adrenaline, you know, the ER, ICU, <laughs> nursing, and I ended up going in that direction. I always look at labor and delivery like what would have happened if I had done that? Like, I don't think I, I I'm pretty sure I would have enjoyed that. Um, but I ended up doing ER and ICU for a number of years and I was always excited when I would get nursing students working with me, you know, I, I just felt like some of the things that had become mundane, um, they're always so exciting for nursing students. Like, you know, they primed the IV bag and they started an IV, like all of those things were so exciting for them that it felt exciting for me. And I really enjoyed that. Um, and so at one point, the folks at Humboldt State University said, hey, you seem to enjoy working with nursing students. You want to be a lecturer up here. So okay. I started as a lecturer there um, and eventually started moving into the tenure track. And I remember there being a really difficult decision when it was time to get a doctoral degree, like do I get a PhD or do I get a DNP? And that one I struggled with for a long time and I still am looking over at the DNP even though I have a PhD like I've never been totally settled I love having a PhD I love my job I love working with students but it has taken me away from patient care and um and I do miss that there's like a little area of my heart that aches a little bit Right. Um, now, you 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 mentioned something. I, I kind of went the PhD route just because it was sort of the classic traditional uh, yeah. route to go. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I mean, DMP, I've, I, have, I have a few colleagues that have a DMP and a PhD. Yeah. Um, but I'm like, I'm like, oh, my God, more school loans or <laughs> things like that. That's just, it's just like, I don't know, like, do I really want more? Um, yeah, because I had I had a I had a job for a few years um, as a project coordinator for for a nurse exec at a hospital I was working at. So a lot of the projects I see DMP students working with, I'm like, oh my god, I used to, I should have it like six degrees based on yes. <laughs> on the work that I've already it's done. So. True. So it's it's very interesting. Yeah, I and actually I just talked to another colleague of mine who's thinking about PhD versus DNP and that piece that if you really don't want to do research, DMP may be the and you still want to stay very on the service side and hands on with the ins and outs of operations. Yeah. That really is like an area that people should look at more. Yeah. Uh, I think at the same time with nursing, and I feel like now I'm interviewing myself. I, 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 I'm, but I feel like, but I feel like uh, nursing hasn't done a great job making uh, the the profession available to DMPs, if that makes sense, right? Like people who have a yeah. master's degree get a DMP and they go back into the exact same role. Yeah, uh, right. And I think that's such a waste of talent. Yeah. Um, um, well. Just keeping it on the upbeat, you know, uh, I think that we're growing in mm -hmm. that regard. I mean, the DNP role is overall relatively new. Yeah. And it seems like there are a lot of st states that have been restricting independent practice. And I just have this feeling that once there is that notion of independent practice that's recognized across states, there's going to be more room for the DNP role yeah. to grow. You yeah, know, fingers but I, crossed. Yeah, like what is the motivation for people to to move up with their education? What do they get? What's the value added? Especially when you mentioned the cost. Like that's one of the things. Like, what's my return on investment if I spend, you know, forty thousand dollars on tuition? Right. I make that money back. Yeah. yeah. I, I wish we saw more uh more 
areas on the service side and uh, and an NP full practice type of thing. I wish yeah. we saw more of that being adopted. Uh, but in time, you're right. We are. It, it yeah. is a fairly new area. So in time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so you so you're in academia now. Uh, and uh, uh, let's talk about some of the work that you're doing now in academia. Um, uh, yeah. Um, well, you mentioned my role as Associate Dean of Health Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, and that is the majority of the work that I do right now. And we focus on that. I mean, that's a fairly broad topic, but there are certainly different buckets that, um, that I'm focusing on within that. Um, one of the primary ones is um, diversifying the nursing workforce, mm -hmm. um, combined with the notion that we need to collectively be moving towards this place of achieving health equity. Um, that's, that's an aspirational thing that's down the road, but I do believe that it is ultimately achievable, but there are a lot of things that go into that. And one of the ways to get toward health equity is through workforce diversity. Um, and one of the things that we know is that when patients have the opportunity to be cared for by people that share some aspect of their background with them, that there's higher satisfaction, there's better communication, um, more likelihood that um, patients, particularly from marginalized backgrounds, will continue to engage with the healthcare system, which of course the the health benefits of that should be obvious. Um, another thing is how important it is for people from marginalized backgrounds to be able to evaluate and write policy. And I have a friend, a colleague of mine says, all policy is health policy, right? And so it can be <laughs> specifically health related policy, but if it's policy related to what schools are doing or food or those things, those ultimately impact health. And so making sure that we have a representative workforce so that you know folks that have maybe experienced housing insecurity in their lifetime would be weighing in on the policies and laws around that. Um, making sure that we have representative nursing re researchers to decide what's being researched, how it's being researched and how those data are being um, interpreted and then also um, having a representative group of faculty that are teaching and we need faculty to weigh in on what's being taught and again, how things are being taught. And so um, I would say a lot of my DEI work is focused on that particular piece. Yeah, uh, now you mentioned, um, uh, I, I kind of want to start like diversifying uh, the workforce, but we have to start through recruitment of yeah. that workforce, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do we make it more, how do we increase access yeah. uh, where we are diversifying the workforce? Because at the end of the day, so many schools just go sort of straight down the line of looking at GPA, how well you did on your entrance exam if you had an entrance exam for your school right or how so so, so many of those yeah. are built on the traditional methods that have kept out yeah. uh, a diverse student body so where does our work start um, yeah yeah i mean you can you can argue way way back in the educational uh pathway you know preschool elementary school um, investing well in those things in our country, prioritizing education overall, right? That's going back to the root cause. Um, I have some colleagues that are working on doing pathway programs, going in and working with third through sixth graders, mm. letting them know what nurses do and introducing them early to, you know, a career in nursing. Um, I recently launched a program called the Shines Program, which um, is a summer institute where we brought in local high school students uh, for two weeks. And um, we did everything from simulations. They had opportunities to look in a, a simulated eye. They 
practice doing ACE wraps and you know, a, a lot of hands-on stuff, but they also learned about applying to college, how to write a resume. We gave them a talk on how to make their LinkedIn site be professional. Um, and it was a really, I mean, the, the students were just amazing. It was, it was really popular um, and we got some great feedback, but that was really us looking farther back into our educational pathway. Um, and then, you know, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, looking at the different entry points, like, you know, LVNs are another group that I think are often, you know, underappreciated in nursing. And when we talk about diversity, there is diversity in nursing, but that diversity is in the LVN population and, you know, grateful to all the LVNs, but I would love to see them see a clear way to get from LVN to higher paying RN jobs and we need them. Um, and then the other thing is once we are recruiting people into nursing programs, we gotta make sure that they're successful once they get into our programs. Um, and so a lot of it is about retention. And my motto is that I don't want students to survive our nursing programs. We want students to thrive in their nursing programs and having that dialogue that makes the learning more robust, that, that sharing. And so that means that students need to feel included and like they're part of an overall team. Otherwise they're not gonna share their insights. They're gonna, they're gonna hold those close and lose that on that diversity piece. And then the other thing is making sure that we're graduating um, nurses who are equity minded and what I mean by that is that they have the, the knowledge and the skills and the desire to make changes, the, you know, understanding that it's not just, wow, isn't it interesting that there's all these health disparities, but really recognizing that collectively, we can move the needle on some of these issues. Um, did I answer your question? Uh, you did, you did. <laughs> Um, I, now, the, I think the challenge uh, for me uh, is really comes uh, is, is again, you have we have a, a system, a school system that is built on really getting people to pass the NCLEX, right? I mean, yeah, that's yeah. that's kind of that's kind of where we are. And then there's yeah. restrictions put on. Um, like the number of units and what needs to be included in those units yeah. and so much of this uh, diversity and equity and yeah. um, uh, and these types of topics that I think are so pivotal for early career to be our ends, right? right? So much of that is pulled out of the curriculum to meet NCLEX needs. And I think that's where I think a lot of schools struggle yeah. Um, but I, I think it's something that we really need to look at. It's something a couple of years ago, as I was teaching, uh, I started to really, uh, really take notice and as far as what I was sharing, uh, and, and making sure that we're discussing some other issues other than what was in the text or what was required. Um, and I think it just, it just requires a little bit of innovation and thinking on faculty of how do we yeah. include that throughout the program where it's not just, oh, here, take a course in, in uh, and how to build, uh, be equity minded, but we build that into the program from beginning to end. Yeah. Um, and then, the, you know, again, looking at pathways, is that, but then how do we get them to, how do we get them the opportunities to actually engage in communities once they are at the service point, you know, where they are at the, at the clinic or at the hospital, how do they engage? Because if you look at a lot of hospitals don't necessarily engage with the communities that they're supposed to be engaged with, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that that's another struggle is how do you keep them, how do you keep them um, uh, kind of hooked, right? Yeah. You yeah. you kind of you kind of build a foundation. You let them go, hoping something happens. But where does where does that something happen? How do we right. create those additional opportunities? Yeah. Um, so great points. Um, now you um, now as you're uh, in in your in in your role, um, how have you seen, um, for example, even at your own institution, um, some things uh, change? as far as your programs, because I see a lot of 
positions like yours being created throughout yeah. Yeah. throughout the nation, which is fantastic, and I love to see it because it it means institutions are investing uh, in this. Um, but where where do you where have you seen change, and how do you see that? Where do you see the impact uh, down the line? Yeah. Ali, so many, there, there are so many great points that you made there. And um, a lot of the things that you're pointing out are examples of structural inequities or structural problems that we need to address if we're really gonna have the outcomes that we wanna have. And so I'm gonna, in, in talking about some of the things I focus on at my institution, I'll try to address some of the issues that you brought up, standardized exams. Um, one of the things that we did um, as we were creating our master's entry program in nursing is we decided not to require the GRE, um, which at the time, what was that, um, maybe 2012, 13, that was kind of a radical idea that that we would do this thing. And, you know, people are like, well, how do you know if they're, you know, <laughs> academically capable? But if we go back and look at the genesis of standardized exams, like where did they come from? They came from, I mean, the, the, the gold standard of uh, testing is the SAT, the Scholastic Aptitude Test. Well, where did that come from? That was created by somebody named Carl Brigham back in the 1920s. He was part of the eugenic society. Like that was actually a group of people. He was loud and proud about being part of that group. And he made it clear that what his research was doing was trying to prove that white people were smarter than people of color. Wow. And he wrote a book about it. It is a very difficult book to read, but he was making his points. And um, so that was 1923 that that book came out. And 1926 is when he introduced the Scholastic Aptitude Test. And then that was then adopted by universities as sort of the gatekeeper of who got into institutions. So it's interesting how nearly a hundred years later, we still have the same results coming out of standardized exams that align with what Carl Brigham said was his goal to establish. So I wonder about the validity of standardized exams. And there are some things that we know about the way people process information like there's low context thinkers and they're high context thinkers. Your low context thinkers are able to kind of look at a bunch of information and just get to a particular piece of information. And as you would imagine, those folks are fairly good at um, multiple choice exams. There is another group of us, high context thinkers that you get a bunch of information and you're looking at the relationships between all those pieces of information. And when that's happening, a multiple choice exam, you know, your thoughts are, well, what if, but I need to know this to know that. And how can I possibly understand this piece without understanding the context, right? And so in terms of practice, you actually probably want to be cared for by a, a high context thinker, somebody that will notice that, you know, your broken leg is actually attached to a person that's attached to a family that is, you know, mixed into a community. Um, maybe your surgeon, yeah, if they're just focused on your leg, that's great. Um, so it's not that there's anything wrong with either kinds of thinkers. It's just that both kinds of thinkers are valuable, whereas standardized exams favor low context thinkers. Um, and we see this often with students that they're not doing good on their exams. They appear to be a C student, but when they get into clinical, they're doing really well. Or the other way around, people are doing great on their exams, straight A student, but they get into clinical and they can't make critical clinical decisions about, you know, next step sort of thing. Um, so the pandemic has given us an opportunity to think about standardized exams. There were a lot of universities that said, we're gonna waive the SAT this year. And guess what? The world did not fall apart. The universities did not close down for lack of academic ability. So we just have to think about some of those um, those sort of things that we hold sacred that are not actually getting us where we want to go. Um, and you also mentioned, you know, the NCLEX and what's taught in school, that it is really easy for schools 
to focus so much on their NCLEX pass rates that they're missing opportunities for, for service learning. Um, and you also get students that are like, why are you teaching me to think? I came into nursing school because I wanted to start IVs. And it's like, anybody can start an IV. I can teach my 12 year old to start an IV. That's not you know, super difficult. But what is difficult is to make clinical decisions um, because those will have repercussions down the road. Um, so those are some of the things I do focus on in my DEI role and, and some of the things that our school in particular has been trying to solve. But these, these again are structural problems. There's no easy solution and we have to come to consensus as a profession about, you know, are our values aligning with our outcomes? Right. And historically, I mean, we are, we are, and I feel like I say this in every episode now, uh, we are primarily a uh, white female dominated profession. And at the same time, um, we are, we, some of the things that I think we do as a profession, uh, we are still not okay with changing. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you look at some of the, like the board of directors or, or, or advisement councils for some of these organizations, they still are primarily white. Uh, yeah. And I'm not sure if, uh, um, you know, at what point, uh, and there's, you know, we're, we're how do we self-govern when when we a lot probably a good chunk of the profession is not seeing itself as having a problem perhaps yeah um so i mean i mean that, that those are um those are and, and again i i don't want to i don't want to sound like i i know the answer because i i don't um uh, but it's just uh, these are the questions like i've ha i've asked myself for the last few years uh, as i've engaged more with the profession in a different way um, yeah. and I think that's, that's important. Um, where do you see, where do you see, uh, us making change as we move forward? For example, the American Nurse Association just came out with, with this, uh, sort of, a apology, uh, uh about mm -hmm. what they have done in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's some, there's, you know, there's, there's some movement around bringing some of the diverse population of nurses together. Uh, on a national level, um, but where do you see us moving as a profession? Because we can't wait till the entire profession is diverse and then say, okay, now we yeah. can do something. That's going to be, that's right. like decades down the line, hopefully. Um, uh, but where do you, where do you see us doing some of the groundwork now um, outside yeah. of academia to, um, to really build a strong foundation for the profession to really move in a way where we are not only moving toward toward a more diverse workforce, but we're, we're we become that equity minded now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, and you know, there's no simple answer to that question. I mean, like I was saying earlier, I think that the goal is health equity. But when we look at, you know, what is the opposite of health equity? It's health inequities. How do we measure health inequities? We measure it through health disparities. And when we look at those inequities, nothing has a singular solution. Like I always hear people like, what is the thing that we need to do? It's not that easy. It's a wicked problem. There are multiple things that we need to be working on. And because of that, I believe that there's space in this work for everyone. Um, so that said, something positive happened in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. Hmm. And as somebody that's been doing this work, the DEI work for about a decade and a half, I have spent the majority of my career trying to convince people of the value of diversity, trying to convince people that there is really an issue, that there are things like racism and ableism and homophobia, and that those things have very big impacts on people across the educational system, carceral system, healthcare system, you know, everything. And so, you know, a lot of times people will be like, yay, you know, that was really interesting, but what does this have to do with me? And so in when we first entered the pandemic, I, I was worried. I was like, nobody's going to care 
about this work. Everybody's focused on on responding to and going to Zoom classes and these sorts of things. I mean, really real issues, but I was like, we're gonna stop talking about diversity. And then a couple of months later, George Floyd was killed. Um, and you know, the the one good thing that has come in the wake of his killing and Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor and so many others is that people saw this on their television when they were stuck at home and they were like, what is actually happening here? This We're seeing this, there's evidence of this. And um, people have been reaching out in a way that I've never seen before. I mean, at that time I was doing probably two talks a month um, for the time since then, it's been sometimes two talks a day for me, um, which is, is positive. Um, I think that there's a lot of room, you were talking about this earlier, on many of the nursing professions boards to take this seriously, which they have. I mean, so many organizations are like, we're going to focus on this. How do we do it? That is a positive. I was so relieved to read the report that came out of um, ANA from um, the, the report where they were looking at racism and nursing. And yeah, there was accountability. There was a statement about where we are and where we can go. And um, I'm deeply grateful for Dr. Ernest Grant. And this is one, I, I would uh, hold him up as an example of why it's so important to diversify nursing leadership. He had a big hand in doing something that nobody had done prior to his leadership. And we need to see more of that. Um, and I, I think that each organization can be asking themselves, what is our role? What is our piece of the health equity pie? What are we going to address? Um, and then for individuals, I think it's important for them to stop saying, this is somebody else's problem. It's not me, I'm caring for patients is what I hear, but it's like, yeah, the way that you care for patients matters. Um, and the way that you focus on some of these social issues that create the health outcomes that we see have to be addressed. And we're actually central to that. Um, there are 4 million nurses in the United States. We have a voice. We just need to leverage that voice in a way that helps change policy and practice, standards of practice, those sorts of things. Um, great, great points. Um, uh, you mentioned policy uh, and it's a piece that I think uh, we don't address enough as far as the role of nursing and policy. Um, how would you recommend for somebody who's listening to this podcast and how would you recommend for somebody to get involved in the world of policy if they're looking to like, yes, I can, I can go help at a community center or for, you know, everything, like you mentioned, everything, yeah. every policy is a health policy. Like I can, I can do a lot of things, but if somebody's looking to get involved in the world of policy specifically, how would, what would your recommendation be for a beginner? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it seems very daunting because the language of policy can be very dry. Right. <laughs> Um, I have so many of my nursing students, you know, I'll ask them, how do we make big impact on something like food insecurity? And they say, well, we should tell politicians to do something. And it's like, that is a good start, but we need to do more than that because I don't know that I want politicians being the ones to write up policy around food and housing insecurity. They're, they're the voices, the advocates to get that through, but they are experts that are informing them. And we need to be those experts. We need to have the skill to see what needs to be done and to write that in the format of policy. You know, it needs to be evidence-based. We don't just come up with wild opinions. We need to think about the stakeholders that are involved in that process. Um, we need to have a, a way of evaluating whether that policy or procedure is actually giving us the, the thing that we think it is. I mean, oftentimes we write a policy with the best of intent and there are unseen consequences of that policy. So if you can get a group of people in to be able to look at the potential consequences of it, you're more likely to mitigate or be able to see problems earlier on. 
Um, and then, you know, the other thing, we need to have um, more diverse people at the table. And so that means that when you are, when you are at the table, look around, and think about not whose voices do I wanna represent, but whose voices do I wanna make sure at the table with me? And so that is good for representation, but it also helps you form the way that you're thinking. Like, you know, I don't know about you, Ali, but I know that within my brain and my cranium, I can become limited in what I'm able to see on my own, the ideas I'm able to generate on my own. And I need other people to help me think in ways that I haven't thought before. And that is really one of the powerful things about diversity. I mean, it's really easy if you're working in a group and all of you instantly agree like, oh, we're done, let's go to lunch. But if everybody is agreeing on something, it's likely that you're missing really important pieces of it. There should be debate. It should be difficult conversations. You really need to get into the the density of the issue at hand. Um, I also think that there are some communication skills that are needed. Um, a lot of times people are worried about that conflict, that it seems like conflict, but there can be healthy conflict when we're debating ideas and where to go next. And that's a, po a positive thing. That's not necessarily a relational thing. You can disagree heavily with somebody in a meeting and then go out and have lunch and you know be hanging out like you always do. That's what we're looking for. That's great, um, uh, it, it, and and you bring up a really really great point as far as uh, also looking at looking at the people at the table and who's not there. Yeah. Uh, and I think that speaks, uh, and I think that's that's been one of our biggest issues is not having the right people. Because I don't know about you, but uh, I I've been to a few meetings where you see the exact same people on yeah. completely different topics. But just because of their position in life, they get a seat at the table. I'm like, are you really the right person, or should you have said, yeah. you know what, I'm, maybe I'm not the right person. Uh, here's the right person that should be sitting in this chair. Yeah. Um, I think I think that that's that that that's one of the important things that um, I I have noticed a little bit more as I, as my career has grown and mm -hmm. just my how I view things has changed is yeah. is looking at um, who's at the table, why they're at the table, and if somebody else should be at the table. Yeah, um, so, that takes uh, a certain amount of humility too to recognize that maybe you're not the expert at everything. And, and that's the piece I think uh, you also mentioned is that expertise. How does nursing build that expertise? Because so many of us are again going back to sort of where acad academia is where we're put on this path of oh you're going to be a nurse and we're going to feed you everything you need to know how to do bedside nursing and then you go into a master's program this is everything you need to know on how to do a assessment and write prescriptions and pharmacy and this where does where do we grow outside of academia or even within academia yeah. um where do we grow that we are expanding our, our our knowledge base as far as where we built expertise in those things like communications and advocate like we I can do as a new nurse I might be able to do great advocacy for my one patient but how do I advocate for a community right. how do I advocate for like a, a a population of people because it seems like you mentioned it seems so such a huge thing to do as an individual yeah. Um, and that, that, that might be like a bigger conversation somewhere down the line, but like, how yeah. do we, how do we grow that? So I think that there are some cultural norms within nursing that we have to collectively look at. And one of those cultural norms is to value certain, um, nursing specialties over others. Like it, it would be hard to argue against the fact that people somehow for some reason value acute care nursing more than community health nursing you know why is that that doesn't that has never made sense to me yet i've been very clear that that was the case when i was a nursing student and continues to be the case today i mean we have a, a lot of students that come in and they're like yeah i want to be a community health nurse and by the time they get out of the program 
so many people that they've worked with in the hospital are like, don't do that. That's career suicide. You need to get, you know, pay your dues on the medical surgical floor. Like, what is that? Like, you know, I, I was a medical surgical nurse. Um, I have the utmost respect for the very difficult job that medical surgical nurses do, but that is not the definition of what nursing is. And we really have to think about that differently. Another way that, that we limit ourselves is thinking about ourselves in terms of the tasks that we do. And so many students, like I said earlier, they came in with this notion that a nurse starts an IV, they give medications versus the idea that nurses are excellent communicators. They're advocating for their patients. They see you know, the patient within the context of the family. They're you know, doing all of these other skills that are seen as soft skills or you know, nice if you have time sorts of skills, but those are really the crux of, of caring and, and health you know, is that, that interaction that you have. Um, so I think that we do need to look at some of the things that we've held dear and, you know, kind of toss those up in the air and look at them in a different way. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, agree, agree with that because um, we are, as a profession, we are, uh, as a whole, like if, if I went to a nurse and said, what is nursing, they would, they would pretty much uh, break down their day of, oh, I do this and I do this and those tasks. Right. Uh, and we are not good at um, necessarily saying what nursing does as a whole, uh, which I try to do through these. Actually, I, I use these podcasts in my classes. Uh, and one of the reasons I do it is because I want to expose my students to look what else nursing is doing on yeah. such a larger scale than not that there's anything. Uh, it's just on a different level and it's just on a different um, um, different path, but it's all part of nursing. It's all part of the profession of nursing. And, right. um, and like I said, um, um, that they, uh, so many of my students who I have them do an assignment, just a reflective journal assignment mm -hmm. after they listen to these. And, um, so many of them, uh, end up, um, saying, Oh, I never realized that, or, Oh my God, this is something I want to be, or I was, I was thought about doing, but didn't realize this was an option for me. Right. Um, so I think we have a lot of growing to, to do from a, as a profession in yeah. what else nursing encompasses, as opposed right. to this is nursing and this is not nursing, right. as opposed to everything is nursing and everything's health, just like right. poli everything, all policy is health policy, right? Yeah. It, it, yeah. it all, it all impacts. So I think it's uh, super important. So Ali, as we're talking about this, you know, I just, I do want to address an elephant in the room as we're talking about how we can become better as a nursing profession. And, you know, one of the structural things that we have to address is how hard nurses work. You know, I mean, it's really hard to ask somebody who is working three, four, five, 12 hour shifts a day to address some of these deeper problems that we're seeing in society, right? Like nurses are overworked and, and often, you know, get so giving of themselves that they're willing to do this thing, but it's not sustainable for individuals and it's not helping our profession. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that as we're talking about the, the potential for where nursing can go and the actuality. I mean, just reflecting back when I was um, an ICU nurse, that was also the time that I had small children. So the notion that I was going to get off work and go to a committee or serve on a board, like that just wasn't a reality for me until my kids were bigger. Um, and until I wasn't doing that intensive kind of nursing, you know, literally intensive care nursing, <laughs> you know. Uh, very true. And thank you for bringing the idea. And I always think of it as, you know, it's kind of the same thing with, with, the, with the DMP is like building the capacity, right? Yeah. Uh, and that has to do with, uh, are we building the capacity to do these other things? Which is one of the reasons when the Future of Nursing Report 2020, 2030 came out. And I'm like, how are we doing this on top of everything else that's we're already doing? And a lot of people who, you know, were involved in the report, uh, as I spoke to them, they're like, oh, we're going to build that and integrate it to our daily, daily 
uh, things that we do or some of the stuff that we're actually we're already doing some of this work yeah um which i can appreciate but at the same time is we still need to for the to really get to that kind of ideal uh, place we'd like to be i think we still as a profession we still need to build that capacity yeah. of making the time making uh, so it's not like oh by the way you're working three or four shifts a week and on top of that i want you to be involved be actively involved in this organization and do the, all this volunteer work on top of yeah. that that's not capacity that's just making right. you do more work so yeah <laughs> so yeah <laughs> this movement can't rest on volunteerism right. you know that that ends up being a tax that disproportionately impacts women you know since we're a female dominated profession but oftentimes um people of color as well and that these are individuals that are often very very dedicated to changing some of those inequities and asking folks to volunteer their time all the time you know it's not going to work um, you know, there's there's only so much human capacity in a day or a week, but there's also um, a fairness issue about that. Like the problems that we have, we've gotten here collectively, and we need to collectively solve them. Absolutely, and, and you're and you're uh, especially uh, when when we talk about um, the diver when we when it comes to the idea of diversity. So many so many times, in order to be inclusive. Uh, we bring in uh, the the few diverse nurses that we have around us, and they that really builds up. If you're not building that into their regular time or regular yeah. schedule, um, right. and I think it's uh, and it's the, the, you know what they sh what they share is always appreciated. But again, you're right, um, that's a piece, and I'm always he hesitant to like reach out to some uh, some of my colleagues and say, hey, do you want to work on this? Because I value their their opinion and their and their expertise. But at the same time, it's with the understanding that I'm adding on to their plate, uh, right. which is uh, which is always not a good feeling. Um, but again, I pre oh, thank you. Thank you. You've shared and you've educated me on, on several things. So thank you for that. Um, before uh, we sign off, uh, um, anything else you want to share with us uh, as we're? Yeah, I think my um, parting concept is going to be, you know, this was occurring to me when we were just talking, how do we address these big issues? And I think that there are different um, levels that we address them. And so think about, you know, there are things that you can do as an individual um, in terms of the care that you provide, believing your patients, um, you know, not treating patients as an algorithm, remembering, you know, what brought you into nursing, that we can as individuals be the source of microaggressions. I have a dear friend who um, needs a surgery and she was told, we can't do anything for you until you lose weight. And it's like, really, you can't do this procedure because of somebody's weight. And then their solution is to diet and exercise. Man, if it was that easy to diet and exercise, wouldn't everybody do it? Like that's, it's condescending, it's not helpful. You know, so thinking about that in terms of your, your individual practice. Then there are the things that the inequities that are perpetuated by institutions, like what is the hospital or the health system? What are those policies and procedures? that are leaving groups of people behind. And then there are those structural issues. Those are the laws um, that are from, you know, the local area, the state, the national laws that really impact people widely. For example, how do we pay for healthcare in our country, right? That's, if we could solve that, that would have huge, huge impact. So, you know, I, I just hope that as people are thinking about what I can do, there are things you can do as an individual. There are things that can happen in your institution. And then there are those broader things that we need to do collectively as a society. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your time. I, again, I, I appreciate everything that, that you shared with, uh, with myself and, and the audience. So thank you so much. Um, we've been listening to Dr. Puri uh, Ackerman Barger. She is an Associate Dean of Health Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. As well as, a, as well as a clinical professor at the University of California, Davis, Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day and we'll see you soon.
You've been listening to the RN Mentor with your host Ali Taya. Please don't forget to visit www.aliartayeb.com. That's www.aliartayeb.com for podcast notes and resources. And don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, I wish you fair winds and following seas.